days now, rescuers began looking for him in the mountains Friday night by chopper and even using drones. But the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office says the severe weather over the weekend and the serious risk of an avalanche forced them to stop several times and limit the search. They're now waiting for openings in the weather to go back in here. The Forest Service is coordinating all of this with the county and rescuers say they'll go in by ground when the weather is safe enough. So far, they haven't found any signs of him. We do know that Sands went hiking on Monday on I'm sorry, on Friday on Mount Baldy. Then a friend reported him missing somewhere along the Baldy Bowl Trail. Now that is a popular hike in the San Gabriel Mountains here, and they believe Sands was heading to the summit. Julian Sands is best known for starring in roles in Arachnophobia, The Killing Fields, and A Room with a View. The 65-year-old was born in England and now lives in North Hollywood. David lists these characteristics that makes a missing person case connect with a missing 411 case. Point of separation. If the person is with someone and decides to separate from the group. Time of disappearance. Boulder fields. Um, if there's near water. A weather event uh, which happens close to or after the disappearance disability or illness of the missing person. Canines can't detect the scent when searching for a missing person. Um, the missing person is found in an area that was previously searched. Or if the missing person has missing clothing. Or if the cause of death is unknown for the missing person. And the geographical listing meaning if it was in what they would deem as a cluster area where other disappearances has happened. Glacier National Park is topping over 3 million visitors a year. Yellowstone, over 4 million. But it's not always a vacation or a day trip. Sometimes people who don't, I mean, clearly who want to be found, we still can't find them just because of the amazing kind of landscape that we have. Glacier National Park lets us in on details of two unsolved missing persons cases from the last decade. Mark Sinclair last seen hiking the Highline Trail July 8th of 2019. His photo is still on the trail. This summer, Barry Tragan failed to return to his vehicle near Kitma Lake. Both men left rangers with little to go on. While those two active cases are well known, this park is massive, which is why officials tell us they deal with searches, rescues and missing people every day. The reason why they can't give us an exact number. So it's a really very common occurrence and part of this is planning um, from in terms of hikers of over maybe thinking it's going to take them less time and also family members expecting people to be inc incredibly prompt of they said they'd be back at five. It's 505. Where are they? Austin tells us the search for both men is still ongoing. For Sinclair, they know he went down the Highline Trail, but then after that, there are not enough clues to lead them in a specific direction. Rangers found what they believe to be Tragen sunglasses, but that's it. Yellowstone's in the same bind. We looked through the park's records and found just one active missing person case from 1991. Rescue people said we want you to know we want you to go where David last went. My experience then became walking his path. We came every year for 20 years now. David um, went Memorial Day morning and he left and he was just going to go up and come back. And he was that kind of guy. The last time Susan Quinn saw her son was back in 1998. I brought a picture of David. That was not very long before um, he went missing. David Morrison was from Fresno and a graduate of Hoover High. He was a chef in San Francisco 20 years ago. 
It was Memorial Day weekend when David and a group of friends came to Yosemite to enjoy the outdoors and to get away from the city like many others do. That Monday, David decided he needed to meet the challenge of walking up there, hiking up there and back before he went home. He left his group and hiked up to Yosemite's iconic Half Dome alone. That was the last time anyone heard from him. I came up early at dawn the next morning. Quinn and her family spent the week in the park with search and rescue, but nothing came up. And at the end of the week, at Friday, then they stopped the search. She, along with others, came back several times to search on their own, but nothing was ever found. And because nothing's ever, I, has now been found that located where he died or what happened to him. And his case is not the only one. When someone goes missing or there's some sort of crime that happens and it's not solved, it goes into what we call the cold case file. Scott Gediman from Yosemite says all of these cases are still active and they are not going anywhere until investigators from the park find out what happened. The oldest one on the list dates back to 1969. There are more than two dozen cold cases on this list from missing people to unsolved homicides. Yosemite and Grand Canyon are the most popular ones on the list. In Yosemite alone, there are 10 cases dating from 1972 to the most recent in 2016. People who have simply disappeared. These cases are still active. We're not actively doing stuff every day, but they're active and there's things that we want to remind our rangers and park visitors that these things are still out there. And of Kean McLaughlin, her name is Jolene Daniels. She's joining me from Texas. And you might remember that back in June, uh, Jolene's nephew, Kean, disappeared while in Grand Teton National Park. And uh, of course, there's been a lot of attention lately on Grand Teton National Park with the Gabby Petito case and some other cases. But this is one that's kind of been pushed off to the side. So I'm, I'm glad that, Jolene, that, that I could speak with you today. For those people unfamiliar with your story, with Kean's story, just give us a basic background as far as what happened when, when he was visiting the park, where he's from, kind of set it up for us. Sure. So Ken um, was born and raised mostly in Ireland. He has spent different years over the years in the United States. And so he moved to the United States in the summer of 2019. He was living in Montana with his grandmother and some relatives and working there. But then probably at before COVID, early 2020, he went to and moved to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And so he had been living there a little over a year, maybe a year and a half. He was a ski instructor at the um, ski hill, as well as a bartender in some of the different bistros and stuff in town. So on June 8th, he went out on an afternoon hike. Um, he was by himself. And it was probably just a, you know, kind of an afternoon hike, walk. He met different people um, who do remember him on the trails at different parts of the park. But then he um, went missing. He was supposed to be at work on June 10th and he didn't show up. And then he was supposed to come to work on June 12th. And when he didn't show up again, then his coworkers reported him missing. And they did find his car at the trailhead of Lupine Meadows and um, still there on the on the 12th and the last time his cell phone pinged was in the park on june 8th the day he left to go hiking yes so any idea of of his emotional state that day have you heard from anybody who he was in contact with was he in pretty good spirits yeah i mean Ken is a very uh friendly um easy going um enjoys great conversation with people. And he reached out to some different people that morning um, and was just, you know, texting. Um, he attempted to FaceTime his mother who was living in Ireland and they did not connect that morning. Um, the people who saw him on the um, one gal that the first gal that met saw him at the beginning of the trail, um, they were acquaintances. So they knew each other and she said he was in good spirits. And then the second sighting was kind of in a few miles in and there's some switchbacks and he visited with a couple there 
And so the, the different people who have reported and they've kind of confirmed that the sightings were probably very valid. They said that he, you know, was just in good spirits visiting with other hikers and he was always on the trail when um, the, the three or four sightings that, that they have, he was, you know, on the different trails in the park. Jolene, do you know, was this particular hike, uh, you know, grueling, like one of those really challenging ones where there could have been an accident or was it more just like a trail hike that you could do in a few hours? Well, when you go in at that particular trailhead, um, and I'm not a, an expert at the Grand Tetons. I've just spent quite a bit of time up there in June and July. Yeah. Um, you can go up so far. That's a pretty easy hike. And then you could stay in the lower lakes. And that one would be very common for people who don't hike a lot. And then you can continue to go up. And that's where you would get to the switchbacks. And you go up to some of the higher lakes. And so we do have most of the sightings up. There was one that came in late that had them in the evening down at the lower lakes, but I'm not sure that that one is still, you know, a valid. I'm not sure exactly where the park rangers feel on that. In a remote area of Mesa Verde National Park, rangers found the remains yesterday with personal items consistent with a missing man, Mitchell Staling. He was last seen in June of 2013 after telling his family he was going on a hike. DNA in the Montezuma County Coroner will positively identify the remains. There is no indication of any foul play. Very worried and we, we want to bring Joey home. An Oceanside man is missing tonight after going on a hike to Joshua Tree two weekends ago. The family has searched the area every day since with no luck. San Marcos resident David Espinoza and his family are looking for a sign, any sign of his nephew Joey John Alvarez Espinosa. On Sunday, May 16th, Joey asked his grandmother to drive him up to 29 Palms to go on a hike. He was last seen approximately 30 miles east of 29 Palms on Highway 62. And so he's walking south into the desert. He said he'd be back soon, but hours turned into days. He had a canteen of water. I believe that's all he had. By Wednesday, there was no communication from Joey, so the family filed a missing persons report. He left his phone, and so... Um, Is that normal? No, no. Um, he doesn't do stuff like this. Espinosa says the whole thing is strange. He says his nephew, a 20-year-old self-described homebody from Oceanside, never really ventured out of North County. He has always been close with his family and never kept anyone out of the dark. When she dropped him off, his grandmother last saw Joey, a heavyset Latino man, in a dark blue shirt and black cargo shorts. He didn't have any camping equipment with him. Since last Wednesday, Joshua Tree National Park and San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department have sent out several search groups to the area. They've even had reports of about 15 sightings, but they've all turned up empty. from New York and she went missing on a hike in a relatively small wooded park in western Massachusetts and Megan has not been seen since. For more than a week, search crews have been combing the area looking for the 42-year-old, but so far they have had no luck in finding her. Correspondent Marky Martin is joining us live tonight with a closer look at her disappearance and what we know at this point. Good evening, Marky. Good evening, Marnie. You know, the bucolic Berkshires region of Western Massachusetts has really become known as this relaxing vacation spot, probably best known for its scenery, its outdoor activities. Well, at the very end of March, uh, Marone, who's from the Albany area, teacher, went to escape for a quick getaway, escaping Monday through Friday classroom life. She got there, checked into a hotel, apparently went on a hike, and hasn't been seen or heard from since. And tonight, questions are mounting about what really happened. I haven't lost hope. Peter Naples says it's not unusual for his sister, 42-year-old Megan Marone, to go on short getaways by herself. Her love of hiking and the outdoors, drawing her to the Berkshires for the last weekend in March. I texted with her Saturday night when she was staying at the hotel here here in Stockbridge. She was having a bowl of soup and reading her book and I, 
I said I'd speak with her tomorrow. And that was the last I heard from her. When her family didn't hear from Marone for several days, they got worried and called police. They found her car at Long Coat Park. It's a small park, about 46 acres, and it does have hiking trails. Police believe Marone parked and went for a hike on Sunday, March 27th. For more than a week, searchers have come to the area, even using dogs, drones, and helicopters. They say there was no sign of foul play in her car, and they were able to track her cell activity for a short time before the signal went dead. Based on the last ping from her phone, they have now shifted the search efforts to a private wooded area about three quarters of a mile west of the park. Some areas of the train we're searching are extremely difficult, uh, very, very thick, and that's kind of hampered search efforts. And Authorities have not released the name of the hotel where Marone was staying, but say they have confirmed she was traveling alone. Sound of their boots crunching on the snow, members of the Pemi Valley search and rescue team headed up the trail. While some crews are following the trails, their job to look off the beaten path. For us, we're doing drainages. We're going up uh, the, the rivers and streams that come down. Uh, we'll follow them back up uh, until we get close to the ridge and then cut over and come down another one. Emily Sotello was last seen at the Lafayette Trailhead parking lot. New Hampshire Fish and Game says the 19-year-old Westford, Massachusetts teen's mother dropped her off just before 5 a.m. Sunday morning. Her mother watched her hike, start hiking up the trail, so we know that she, she started from that area and, and we have an idea what her itinerary was. The plan was to hike three mountains, but wind chills last night along the ridge dipped to 30 below zero, according to Pemi Search and Rescue. And Fishing Game says Satello was not dressed for the cold. She was wearing sneakers and, and potentially some wind pants um, and, and not really ready for, for what the temperatures are right now. A Black Hawk helicopter from New Hampshire National Guard joined in the search, able to cover a lot of ground quickly. And searchers are also being assisted by those who just came up to hike. Around the corner from where I'm standing, the family members are here, the wife, the son, a couple of his close friends and his brother, they're all just holding vigil and they're just hoping and praying that somehow he can survive this ordeal that he's going through. Everything is happening 22 miles on the road behind me up on Mount Baldy. The search for a hiker who is a good hiker, a man in very good shape, is missing. Where can he be and can they find him? Four nights now that 52-year-old hiker Sri Mokapati has been missing somewhere in the snow of Mount Baldy. I feel like we're not, we're not hopeless at all. I'm pretty sure he has awareness of what to do to best, you know, conserve his energy. This picture of Mokapati was taken just after 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon by one of the hikers that he was with. He was with a group of five. They decided it was too dangerous to keep going. Cold and snow coming in. But Mokapati said, I want to go to the top and he went on his own. He's a stubborn guy. The brother of Mokapati said that he is an expert climber and that he knows basically everything about these trails because he's been on them so many times. This is uh, maybe his 10th or 11th uh, go visit to the summit. So, so in that sense, he, yeah, he knows the terrain. But there is so much to cover. 23 members of the search and rescue volunteer group from San Bernardino, Tulare, Fresno, San Mateo, and LA counties are up on that mountain. They could not be helicoptered. They had to drive up. The ski lift took them halfway up the mountain, and then they had to climb the rest of the way to the summit. The wind's too dangerous for any air search or to fly any of the volunteers up to the mountaintop. You know, we feel really hopeful that you know he'll, he'll be found soon, and we know that he's out there. In the village, some family members stood by his car, hoping and praying that they find him. And his wife also doing? came here. The tree line is sacred, and they warn people, do not go up there. Is that so? Right, which makes it not surprising to learn of the number of disappearances that have taken place up there. So Mount Shasta is one of these hot spots for disappearing people then? Exactly. Yes, yeah, Siskiyou County is the location that Carl disappeared in. Since 2009, former police detective Dave Politis has been applying his professional investigative training attempting to solve mysterious missing persons cases all around the country. When 10 plus years 
I've looked at over 5,000 search and rescue cases. And in those 1,200 are unexplained. And I mean that cases of possible animal predation have been vetted out. Incidents of mental health, suicide, were vetted out. And what you're left with is a complete void of rational explanation. The area around Mount Shasta has many unusual disappearances. One of the most baffling disappearances that Dave has been focusing on was reported on Mount Shasta in 1999. On May 25th, three experienced hikers, Carl Anders, Milt Gaines, and Barry Gilmore, set off for Mount Shasta's Bunny Flat Trailhead towards the summit. The guys got up to a place called 5050. It was a place where hikers that wanted to summit would either camp there or at the next stop called Lake Helen for the night. The next morning they get up, the wind's howling. The guys were putting the tent together and were stashing it for their climb, and they saw that Carl was looking cold. And so they said, hey, why don't you go to Lake Helens and we'll meet you there. And Carl took off walking. Shortly after Carl left the 50-50 campsite, Milton Berry followed. But when they arrived at Lake Helen, just 650 feet away, Carl was nowhere to be found. Milt Gaines, Carl's partner, got there, and he didn't see Carl, and now he's confused because there's no place between 50-50 and Lake Helen to disappear. There's no obstructions, you're above timberline, there's no big, huge boulders that are gonna get in your way, and it's a solid snow field with no crevices. And that started a week-long search and rescue that would rival any anyone knew about. Now, one of the things that was done on the Landers case is that they checked with US Geological Survey for seismic activity on the mountain. The reason they did that is that sometimes there's a, a avalanche of rock and maybe the climber was covered by the rock and you wouldn't find him. Uh, during the time that Carl was gone, there was no seismic activity. So they know that Carl wasn't covered by rocks. Remarkably, in the more than 20 years since Carl's disappearance, no one has found any clues that could explain what happened to him. I don't know how many people have been up avalanche gulls, but uh, nothing has been found. No metal ice axe, no metal crampons, no colorful nylon pack or coat or black pants or plastic boots, nothing. The search and rescue coordinator on this event was an individual named Grizz Adams. Grizz had been doing this for 30 plus years. Grizz said, Dave, I guarantee Carl isn't on that mountain. He either went up or he went in, but he isn't on. Those were his words. I think that the comment tells you that there were few options for a rational explanation.